first of all, I'd like to um, congratulate Denise on organizing this event and for you coming. It shows that there are people who do care about subjects related to the criminal justice system. Often they're not heard over the voices that complain about the justice system. The most common complaint is published in the media. You'll see it probably uh, every week is somebody complaining about a sentence not being adequate. And the language is often the same. Nothing really happened. This was just a slap on the wrist. I have no faith in the justice system. The justice system is all about the accused. It doesn't respect the victim. That's the constant drip, drip, drip theme. And it's corrosive. And it's produced this bill because the government says that this bill is what the public seems to want. And they promised to give it to us in the last election. They were given a majority, so here it is. And when Denise posed the question for this session about whether or not this legislation makes the country meaner or safer, it's clear by simply reviewing the contents of this very large bill. It comes from the same orientation in almost every chapter of it, even though it addresses many different subjects. Just to take an overview of the subjects that are in this large bill, you'll find that uh, there are changes proposed to the legislation dealing with youths amongst many other things, to make it a sentencing principle for youths uh, to consider general deterrence. In other words, making examples of the accused to try and deter others. For many years in this country, we resisted that notion that we would use young people who are immature uh, as an example for others, but rather we would endeavor to address the problem of the wayward youth knowing that the offense is probably born out of socioeconomic deprivation or maladjustment or poor socialization or immaturity or FASD or some other cause. It takes me back to a time when <clears throat> I was a young lawyer dealing with a case in what was then known as juvenile court. The case involved a young man who got involved in getting in large vehicles parked in a lot not far from here at night and crashing one vehicle into another and causing a lot of damage. The front page of the newspaper was filled with what's happening to the world, we must get tougher on young people, the Juvenile Delinquence Act is inadequate, something must be done about it. And while that was the public clamor, in the juvenile court as it was at that time, was the case of the young man whose personal history was so troubling, so worrisome. His life was so terrible. His deficiencies were um, awful. And sitting in the back of the courtroom was the business proprietor whose equipment had been damaged. And by the end of the presentation, the owner whose equipment had been damaged was offering to do what he could to help this kid. While out in the community, there was a clamor for harsh punishment. That's just an example of what happens when you're dealing with sentencing from a distance and you don't understand the details of the case and you don't understand the individual circumstances. And that's the problem with minimum sentences. Another thing that this bill does is increase the number of minimum sentences. You understand what minimum sentences are. They are when the law says if you're convicted of this offense, this shall be the bottom line, no matter what your circumstances. It's just poor policy. It has always been poor policy. Even for the most serious crime where we've had a minimum punishment for a long time, that is for murder, where the minimum punishment is life imprisonment, and then it's only a question of how many years till parole eligibility, that sentence is often unsuitable for a case when you understand the particular circumstances of it. 
A classic example that I'll mention because we always know, we all know it, is the case of the Saskatchewan farmer, Mr. Latimer. When he was found guilty, the jury said that they recommended that he have a sentence of uh, several months or a year and a half. I can't remember exactly what it was. But the answer was, no, the law requires life imprisonment. You just can't imagine what the particular circumstances are of all offenders who will come before the court. First degree murder. The minimum sentence is life imprisonment, no parole for 25 years. Just thinking of it theoretically, you might say, well, anybody who plans and deliberates on a murder should go to jail for life and not get parole for 25 years. But do you feel comfortable when the, the circumstances indicate it was a mercy killing or a pact between who decided that one would kill the other and then there'd be a suicide? The only thing is the suicide didn't get completed, but the killing of the first spouse was planned and deliberate. Is life imprisonment, no parole for 25 years, appropriate in those circumstances? Of course not. At the other end of the scale, in this bill, it's proposed to have a minimum sentence of 30 days for an indecent act in the presence of a child under 16. Now, everyone might say theoretically, if I can just imagine this sex offender exposing himself to a 14-year-old, I think that's terrible. I think he should be banished from the community. He should go to jail for more than 30 days. But what happens when the accused is the 20-year-old, maladjusted, isolated, psychologically disturbed, uh, retarded in his social development, who exposes himself at a park to a 14-year-old girl? Does it make sense to send him to jail for 30 days? Does it make sense to put him on a range at the local prison for even 30 minutes? where we all know what will happen to this maladjusted 20-year-old. He will become a victim there. He will be um, exploited. He will come out of that prison experience completely traumatized and damaged and perhaps never recover. Whereas what he obviously needed was some counseling. That's what he needed. So I'm, I'm saying to you in general terms not to buy into the notion that minimum sentences are ever a good policy. It's always satisfactory to leave it up to the judge when the judge hears the circumstances of the case. Why isn't it? We have judges appointed to act reasonably in the public interest and if they don't act appropriately it's possible to appeal them. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. In fact that's the most rational way to go. So just giving you another example of of what happens when you adopt a policy that we're satisfying the public's demand to get tougher. What happens is you actually cause harm. And there's a classic advisory which I would offer to you tonight to remember. And it applies not just in the criminal justice system. It applies in, in ordinary life. Raising children, teaching school, or whatever. And the advisory that I'm sure you've all heard somewhere along the way is beware of those in whom the urge to punish is strong. Beware of those whose first reaction is to get tough and bang hard and hurt in response to anything that goes wrong. It's harmful. It produces individuals who will be a greater problem in society than before the intervention. It's simply not acceptable and it's, it's just dumb. And so whoever said in this debate, what we need to do is not get smarter, not get tougher about crime, we need to get smarter about crime, had it right. And I'm going to end on that note by just telling you that it was a delight to read some of what's enhanced in the debate around this legislation. Um, Denise and her colleagues have made very thoughtful interventions in Parliament. So reason is out there. It's just not prevailing. And the problem is 
You and I, as citizens, are blamed for this legislation. We're told this is what we want. We're always complaining. It's not tough enough, and now you're getting it. So I ask you to uh, support those who are trying to be rational about this. It doesn't mean being soft. It means being smart about crime. Thank you.